Susan Sadison, as she accepts the award of excellence for public service. service programs in helping people improve their lives. It's not something that's commonly referred to um, that way oftentimes, but it remains true and uh, I think we're all here to see that it remains true. Um, I'd like to begin my story by talking about uh, the shaping forces that helped lead me to the mission of the development of trauma services. Um, the wellspring of this story uh, is my experience in 1958 of suffering and surviving a vicious brutal attack on my head and face by a young male teenager wielding a steel bar. I was one of five young girls he attacked in the same manner. Nobody had ever heard of serial anything, but that's what it was. Um, there was nowhere to turn for help. My mother felt there was no, no recognition of it, no financial resources, legal or social. And my mother, a divorced, hard-working woman um, with two children, said that, Susan, the government has failed us altogether. And she meant it. Um, following what happened to me, I began to really seek knowledge um, about these experiences and how people who had had experiences like this reacted to it, the, uh, the problems they had, the, the paths they found to resolve. I found, however, there wasn't much that you could read about in this country and this culture at that time, this is 1958, uh, that if I was to read about observations of people who've been through these things like war ravaging their country or whatever, they had a lot to say about things like trauma, uh, but they were the only ones. Um, and I learned uh, a lot from that about how people dealt with the self-destructive uh, forces that a uh, trauma experience often sets in motion. My goal now was not just to survive, but to survive and grow. That became the important part of it. Um, I had an opportunity to join the federal government in 1972, and I saw my role as a first opportunity to contribute to lives that have been victimized. Uh, I, asked, uh, I asked myself, how often do victims of violence, which I was, and it's a, certainly a secret thing then that nobody talked about, um, get this rare public service opportunity to help others so really afflicted. I felt that my role provided a special trust to make that difference. Um, uh, I was lucky to be at NIMH in the early years when we, we really uh, did a lot of survivors in concentration camps and captivity, Vietnam and other battlefields, crime victims, refugees, fleeing political persecution, the aging and child brutality. There was an enormous amount to learn, and we learned it, and um, we're very touched by um, the experiences of all these people. Um, but what I also learned is that this knowledge had been normed on men. Even if there were women in the groups, uh, it essentially was normed on men. And uh, to study women, women uh, by themselves became an abiding goal. Um, it's been mentioned in uh, the, the book that I worked on at Harvard with Marcia Newton talk on uh, women in depression, but this mid-1970s, the first time figures were out that really showed women were twice as depressed as men, and that the depression often went with a lot of the trauma syndrome, and um, we were able to start a lot of things with that. Um, then, of course, the women in violence study, which was mentioned, really uh, helped involve a new uh, intervention of law, uh, intervention model, trauma and the counseling. That is good trauma. Trauma had to be treated, but it had to be treated in the context of all the other coping uh, disabilities you might have felt with it, like uh, substance abuse and uh, depression and, and many other things. So that if it was done in an integrated way, people really, really had the capacity to recover. Uh, extremely rapidly in a lot of cases, but if it was done silo by silo, it had no effect at all. So we learned by these things, we kept moving forward. Um, uh, the development of these effective trauma services that people knew ushered in the trauma-informed care movement. Um, this, uh, the race uh, of trauma in the public health system certainly seemed to merit this. 
insofar as we can tell today, it's about 100% of the men and women coming for services in the public mental health system have backgrounds of trauma. So trauma-informed care asks that you assume that everybody does, and it really starts you in a very different course of interaction than the old authoritarian mental model that prescribes. Um, it establishes a respectful partnership for provider and consumer toward healing and recovery, and um, it really frees people to develop um, in their own way. Um, there are no uh, particular guideposts that they must reach in one kind or another, but it frees them in their own development. Um, trauma from care has caught on well beyond our expectation, imagination, or even understanding. Um, it's now become a cross-cultural public health movement uh, that restores lives of hope. So that is my story. Thanks. Thank you.